Well, thanks very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I, I appreciate everyone for taking the risk with the Zika virus pandemic that's coming and being in a group like this. So, so with, the, with the Paris conference and all, nuclear power is supposedly an option again. Uh, and we've been given permission to think about it again. Several of my colleagues had asked me to, to give an update on what's happening in nuclear power uh, as part of this seminar speaker series. And I, the short answer is that not very much has happened, and I'm going to try in the next hour to talk, talk a little bit about why and how we got here. And for the students in the room, talk a little bit about some of the history. Um, I'll, I'll start by going back with some of the simpler times when, when energy policy was, was pretty easy. Uh, during the Industrial Revolution in, in Europe, uh, they simply ran out of wood. They deforested Europe, and the question was simply find a new fuel. They went to northern England and dug up some coal, and they were problem solved. So there was, there was a simpler time. Uh, and nowadays, or I should say when I was a kid, it was actually much more, it started to be more complicated. This was a uh, report that Jimmy Carter sanctioned called the uh, Global 2000 Report. And when I was growing up, every news program showed people starving in Africa. The resource uh, scarcity was impending. MIT did a big global uh, uh, resource model, massive computer uh, solution for all the resources in the world. They said everything is going to be running out. And we were in deep trouble. Um, sure enough, that didn't really happen. And like most models, uh, things go awry. And this, this, for example, is the World Energy Outlook uh, prediction of, world, of oil prices. And so if you see what they predicted in, in 1998, low oil prices, and then, of course, they went up in time, and they recently came down. And I've learned from my oil colleagues that the best predictor of future oil prices is the oil price today. So that's the story of, of modeling these uh, sorts of uncertainties. So to take up a little bit of poll at how we all think about our uncertain times, let me ask if for a show of hands, with continued carbon dioxide release into the atmosphere, who thinks that, that it's uh, likely this is going to cause significant, possibly catastrophic ecological and societal damage? Who, think it's, who thinks it's likely? Who thinks it's unlikely? A few. Anyone say yes or no? No one's going to say yes or no, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You'd be predicting the stock market. So with that question answered, and it depends on the audience, so you usually get 50-50 sometimes, do we have commercial technology today to maintain increasing global economic prosperity and eliminate the reliance on fossil fuels? How many think that's yes, we have technology today to do it? So again, well this time about 50-50, who doesn't think we have that technology? Okay, so we, we have a, a mixture, so it's uncertain in some ways what, what's going on. And that's really the, the, the story we have today, is as we cruise forward in history, we knew somewhere in the future there's a certainty that fossil fuels will ultimately be too expensive to use anymore. They're not going to run out, but they will, there's a finite amount of fossil fuels, unless you're a few of the Republican candidates. So there's a finite amount, and they are being made very slowly, but slowly. There's this climate change fog that's, that's come on us, and also the time at which we're going to run out of fossil fuels has changed. So how we make global policy decisions in this fog is, is difficult, and how we make decisions in, in uncertain times is all about what risk is, is uh, associated with. The overwhelming majority of scientists are saying, A, climate change is real. Climate change I don't know of any era in world history where the climate has been stable. Climate is always evolving, and natural disasters have always existed. The science is off. And let me point to a very recent example. That's the most important thing. The science is off. We just had a snowstorm two weeks ago in New York. Let me get this straight. You do not think that human activity, the production of CO2, has caused the warming to our so there's a lot of signal-to-noise problems. And, and people always, especially us, we say, why don't they listen to the scientists? Well, we do the same thing, right? We put out a lot of noise. There's breakthroughs on everything under the sun. And uh, we, we read them in the paper, and we make claims that are clearly not uh, really uh, justified. In fact, yesterday I was at the gym, and I happened upon this one in this new the bottom line. I guess it's a student paper here on campus. And here's where I found that we have apparently uh, an artificial leaf that will totally remove our dependence on, on oil and gas. And, and these are the things that we're saying. So it's not unreasonable to see why the public doesn't necessarily listen to scientists. 
what, what we can all agree on is that we use a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, we depend mostly on oil, gas, and coal. And that someday, depending on what your perspective is, that fossil fuel will become too expensive. Probably before then, the CO2 from the combustion will cause intolerable harm to the environment. And we don't know how long that's going to take. We don't know how much energy we're going to need in the future. But we know that's going to have to change. So what, if you squint a little bit and you ask what people do about all of that, is they've applied sort of a diversified risk management schemes. They've, everyone's looking at efficiency. That's what this organization is all about. It sponsors these lectures. So increased efficiency is what everybody is doing. And then people are looking at CO2 free generation using sustained nuclear reactions. And I say that because all of the options that we have, solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, are all driven by sustained uh, nuclear reactions. None of these technologies, by the way, are new. 1957 was the first production facility built for solar pa panel production commercially. 1957 was the first nuclear power plant built for commercial use. Hydro and wind have been around since ancient times. So these are all old technologies. So all of this old stuff relying on sustainable or sustained nuclear reactions, especially our, in our sun fusion reactions, but also within the Earth. The sustained nuclear reactions within the Earth keep the, co the core molten. It would have cooled by now without those, and they keep us alive. So we don't know a lot about even our solar system's formation. Recently, we found a new planet. But what we do know about the crust and the formation of the Earth during the aggregation of the, of the planet was that we had a lot of potassium-40, and we had thorium and uranium as part of the formation of the Earth from the early uh, uh, debris in the universe. And so these are common elements in the, in the core. And potassium is what gives you your background dose. Radio, radioactive potassium-40 emits 1 MeV radiations. And this is what gives you about, while you're sitting here, 3,800 counts per second of dose, if you will, uh, with, with uh, radiation. Uranium and thorium, the, the actinides, are, are prevalent in the core. And what we'll talk about here is the, the fission reaction predominantly from uranium-235, but also from plutonium, where a neutron is absorbed into this nucleus, making, making it have more neutrons and desiring to fission into fragments. And the, the power in, in nuclear reactions is from the slowing down of these fragments as they slow, collide with other things in, in the uh, matter, and they, that lo loss of energy is what generates the heat. Um, and we'll, that's what we'll be talking about. Interestingly, if you look at the formation of the Earth and the, the potassium-40 and the uranium-235, which warmed the core and gave us a molten core, as these decayed in time, uh, this was what, again, kept the planet alive and what early on generated lots and lots of volcanism. But what, an interesting thing happened about two and a half billion years ago in a place in, in Africa, it wasn't called that at the time, and the plate wasn't even really there. But uh, a kind of a curious phenomena occurred, a kind of a chance occurrence, if you will, where ra the, the lots and lots of rain in that time washed uranium down through permeable soils and put the right combination of uranium and water together so that the neutrons emitted spontaneous fission of the uranium generated more fissions because the neutrons were slowed down and had a high probability of interacting with other uraniums in the soil. And the so-called Oklo uh, natural reactor was formed. And when they were digging there in the uranium mine, they found plutonium. They found fission fragments. And sure enough, nature had created its own natural uh, nuclear reactor, which ran for about 100,000 years or so. So nature was able to make a fission, sustained fission reaction uh, go for uh, quite a, a long time. Now, two and a half billion la years later, we figured out why. And probably one of the greatest triumphs of, of civilization is, is the understanding of the atomic nucleus and our understanding of the forces that hold nuclei together and the, the, our ability to probe these things is, is, is just extraordinary. We know now why heavy nuclei, things with lots and lots of, of uh, uh, particles in them tend to favor and tend to get more stable as they fission apart. And we know why light nuclei tend to fuse together to form more stable mid-range uh, nuclei infusion. And both of those things emit uh, 
uh, radiations and energies in the, from those reactions in the million of electron volt range, so a million times more than we're used to with chemical reactions. So in 1942, in a squash court, uh, for the first man-made sustained nuclear reaction was run. And you can see that he's controlling it by hand with a control rod being moved in and out of the, uh, of the core. And, and the, the calculational intensity to, to design and, and build this thing was done primarily on slide rules. So that the, our knowledge of the, the phenomena was limited, and yet we were still able to make it uh, operate. And it was called CP1 because Enrico Fermi described it as a crude pile of black bricks and, and wooden timbers. These first reactions were, were not actually to produce electricity. That wasn't even in anyone's mind. This were, these were chemical reactors to make materials. They were designed to make plutonium. So neutrons would be absorbed in natural occurring uranium-238. Then th those neutrons would make uranium-238 into plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 was something that was used uh, for, the, for weapons. Uh, but that's what the purpose of the reactors were. And they had to cool it because there was a lot of heat generated by the fission fragments. So they used water to make steam. And because, as an afterthought, the Atomic Energy Commission, which was formed at the time to uh, regulate and to uh, oversee the, the activities in, in atomic energy, they allowed Westinghouse to modify the basic batch reactor that was, was approved to make uh, plutonium and to make some electricity. So, but it wasn't the design basis of the, of the process in any way. It was an afterthought, if you will. So through lots of good engineering work, pe the people at Westinghouse and other companies developed the basis of today's modern reactor fleet. Many of uh, those of you who take my reaction engineering class know that we can use basically the same equations that you use in solving for a chemical reaction. There's, there's reaction kinetics and there's coupling between the, the, th the uh, temperature and the reaction uh, terms, and, and we know how to do this very well today. At the time when they were doing it, though, they were using very rudimentary uh, codes. They weren't able to do three-dimensional numerical simulations. This was all done in a very rough and, and uh, uh, crude way, but yet these react early reactors uh, worked quite well. And you're, they were getting pretty high uh, power densities from the very beginning. And that was a, a trend in the industry to keep very high power densities because for the purposes of making uh, materials like plutonium, you wanted a lot of neutrons, and the neutron uh, production rate was proportional to the power density. They, quick, they knew early on, though, that if they used these plutonium-making uh, re reactors, which were using slowed-down thermal neutrons, depending on uranium-235, they would run out of fuel if they were ever going to use them for a power source. And so uh, the idea was to figure out a way to make more fuel. And so for breeding purposes, they used the more, much more abundant uranium-238, which is what absorbs a neutron and makes plutonium. 239, and that plutonium could also be used in a power reactor if you used what so called fast neutrons, the ones that hadn't been slowed down in the oxygen yet, or in the uh, moderator in uh, the water yet. So, uranium was the early uh, breeding uh, nucleus, and the uranium 238 was 99.3% uh, or so of all uranium on Earth. Another process, which is talked about in the news a lot, is uh, thorium. And thorium also absorbs thermal neutrons, just like uranium does. Uh, and it forms uh, uranium-233 after a couple of, uh, of uh, decays. And that uranium-233 is now itself a fissile nucleus. So when you talk about thorium reactors, you're really talking about a uranium reactor. The thorium is the source of the fissile uranium-233. So they are, in fact, uranium uh, reactors. So the first generation of reactors that came out commercially, the so-called light water reactors, light because they were using regular water, H2O, rather than deuterium, D2O, these light water reactors were the commercial product of primarily Westinghouse and GE working with various national labs and, and so forth. And what was interesting about them in some ways and also troubling from a safety point of view is that they all had to use very high pressures. Even though the boiling water reactor boiled the water so it didn't need to have such a high pressure to keep it as a liquid, it's, it was still at 75 bar with relatively low outlet pressures. The, the pressurized water reactor held the pressure on the water so that it wouldn't boil. And so it had to go to higher pressure. And then they go through a steam, uh, steam generator into a secondary loop and make 
the electricity. But and after the, the nuclear reactor part, it's a re basically what you would see in any coal or gas plant. It's just a transducer into uh, electricity. So it's really just a heater at the end of the day. So from 1942, from the first pile, if you will, till 1972, there was an enormous amount of engineering. And we were able to develop commercial light water reactors and, and liquid metal fast breeder reactors to breed additional fuel. And this was really a time of great excitement. And there was a vision to get there. And in fact, what was interesting about carbon free production, we went from 6% of the global energy being produced from non-carbon producing uh, technologies up to about 12% in a relatively short time. And they were putting online maybe one one gigawatt nuclear reactor every 17 days at the heyday. So they really are able to scale up with these kinds of technologies. There's a history of doing it. Uh, and in fact, if you really want to do something, you can get a lot done. So I was in uh, junior high school then, and I, I used to read Scientific America voraciously, and there was lots of articles in, in there about nuclear power. There was one in particular I remember with a, a million boxcars represented of coal and one boxcar of, of uranium, and that was the relative energy density of the two fuels. Anyway, I read this article in, in junior high school from Glenn Seaborg, and I still have the, the, the original today, and it was just fascinating to me. Here's Glenn Seaborg, this great scientist, talking about this need to change our electric power makeup for, for all kinds of good reasons, and describing in this, re this article the breeder reactors and how these kinds of things could produce fuels at, that would take care of our utilization of our finite coal and oil and gas, and eliminate some of the air pollution, and that, that you could make more fuel than you burned. And that was fascinating to me, that you could actually have a process that would end up making more fuel than you were using. He focused on uranium and thorium. So this, certainly generated my early interest in nuclear science. Also, they were building lots of nuclear reactors. This is the construction rate of nucle new nuclear reactors in the uh, world. And there was this big ramp up. And initially, this was in the early days, in the 60s, it was primarily because of resource uh, uh, fear. They were worried they were going to run out of oil. They hadn't done it yet. The price wasn't high. It was actually pretty low. But they were, were worried about the future and the resources that were coming. So there was a big build. The, the, the great increase, though, came from price changes because the price of oil went up so high and this, uh, this uncertainty about price was, was what really drove a big upsurge in, uh, upsurge in reactor con uh, construction. So this is when I go to UC Berkeley to, to study nuclear physics and engineering. I'm, I'm excited. I arrive. I graduate. And boom, I killed the industry <laughs> Sing single-handedly. So, Looking back at the history of this, the most common answer for why this happened is, is what? Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island. Okay, good, good. And that's, it, that is what most people think. But in fact, if you look at the trend, Three Mile Island, it was an accident in Pennsylvania. We'll talk about it briefly. It happened here after the peak, actually. And Chernobyl, which was supposedly the death nail of the industry, was long after they stopped building reactors. In fact, it wasn't about either of those accidents. The, the reason the industry turned down was different. If you look at what built it, it was prices and future resource shortages concerned. That's why they were building them. In fact, oil and pr gas prices both went down dramatically, and the regulations changed so that building them, was, they weren't just weren't competitive. This was a, it was an economic decision. It had nothing to do with the accidents were important, and there were ways to, to sort of s say it differently, but it wasn't what really drove it. You know, Bhopal didn't turn down the sales of mattresses. Mattresses that used your polyurethanes weren't boycotted after Bhopal. So it, it, because of a different, it was an economic driver. In general, it's an economic driver in energy. If you look worldwide, that, after that peak in construction, there were other little peaks. When people were worried about price and resource shortages, again, there was a little upsurge in, in construction. Sure, Fukushima dampened that, but then it went back up again in other places of the world outside of the United States where they have those concerns of resource shortages. We know we don't have resource shortages in the United States, so we're not worried about that one anymore, but we might be worried about CO2. So Scientific America, of course, is my source of everything. <laughs> Here was an article just uh, last year on that nothing could stand in the way other than fear and capital. Well, actually, it's not true at all. There's plenty of capital in the world. People have plenty of money to invest in things that make money. It's really a return of inv on investment that, that stopped it. It's not fear or uh, lack of capital. 
on the World Nuclear Association webpage, they say nuclear power is cost competitive with other forms of electricity generation, except when there is an access to low cost fossil fuels, which is everywhere. So, a car and a carbon tax won't do it, even at $50 a, a ton, it doesn't add enough to make today's nuclear reactors cost effective. The problem is that it's really hard to meet, uh, compete with oil and gas. The coal and natural gas combustion are cheap. It's cheap to build them, it's cheap to put them in at about a dollar a watt output of electricity. And, that's, and there's lots of projects that are going on. You can look them up and you can find the real cost of these things going in worldwide is low. And it's very difficult to compete with that. Go oil and gas and, and coal will continue to be cheap as a feedstock for a long time. Their price on a per kilowatt hour basis is two cents, three cents, four cents, depends on where you're buying it from. So this is, these are cheap fuels and they're very, very difficult to compete with on a, a cost basis, especially under the circumstances that we'll talk about. So on the capital side, innovation always tends to drive cost down. The experience curve is something that's well described and people talk about it a lot. And in fact, solar and wind and all kinds of technologies that we see around fuel cells, everything kind of follow these experience curves. Combined uh, cycle gas turbines, of course, also follow it and, and things that you don't necessarily want to see promoted. All of them tend to get cheaper with time, and that's why we can buy things today that only kings could have afforded a, lot, a long time ago because when they're built and produced in mass, the price comes down. This is true with lots of things that we take for granted. If you look at air travel or uh, chemical plants or computers, they tend to get safer, cheaper, and better with time and with experience. Uh, and that's what, what uh, competition is, that's what innovation is all about. Cars, big, big changes over 30 year periods, lots and lots of innovation, getting safer, cheaper, and better with each decade. You know, uh, the, a lot of the innovation goes in how you manufacture them, and we've seen a lot of benefit from that in, in wind and solar, whereas they've manufactured these things in much smarter, much more efficient ways, the prices get driven down. The problem with nuclear technology is that in, 19, in, in roughly the 1970s, the innovation stopped. Through the 1950 to 1970, there was a fair amount of innovation because they had to go from basically things that only produced weapons to at least the first commercial units, and there was a fair amount of innovation, all overseen by government agencies. Initially, the Atomic Energy Commission was, was formed to oversee all nuclear technologies, both power and weapons. That went, came, became the... Uh, the energy resource uh, something or other division by Gerald Ford and the NRC was formed in 1974 and then the DOE was formed by Jimmy Carter in 1977. So these were agencies that were, were overseeing both p power and weapons. Then we had 40 years of, of technology hibernation. We'll talk about why that is. Basically, reactors in 1960 were the, the first pressurized water reactors look identical to what's being built today with a few minor changes. We have certain regulations that tell you what they have to look like, and, and that's what it has to look like. So we really stopped the innovation back in the, in the uh, 70s. And if you look at the cost curve, nuclear is the one standout. In time, with more and more capacity being built, its cost goes up. And in many places, it's gone up by a factor of 10. And, and you have to ask, why is that? It does, it's, it's the one technology that doesn't really fit. Vogel is a reactor project in, in uh, Georgia. If you look at Vogel, it took 20 years to build Vogel 1 and 2, $9 billion for 2.4 gigawatts. Today, it's still not done. It started in 2009. It's going to be well over $16 billion before it's done. So price went up, time to build it went up. Everything went in the wrong way for technology that was done already. We recently had a collaboration with Jenny Reese looking at some of these costs and trying to quantify what's, what, how things have changed in time. And if you look in the US, the, oh, this is the overnight capital cost. Uh, outside of Asia, the ca you know, overnight capital cost has skyrocketed. The U US especially up to $12 or so a watt. Uh, in Asia and even in France where they're building, still building reactors, the price has trended upwards. So the, the cost has trended upwards, but it hasn't gone downwards, mainly because they're doing, using exactly the same designs that they've always used. Uh, they're building, uh, building more of them but they're not changing the design at all. The time it's, it's been taking to build them also has gone from early on, maybe five years, four years, back in the 70s, up to 10, 15, 20 years to build them. 
So people are put, spent shelling out a couple billion dollars in capital, and then they're sitting on it for 10 years, and that no one's going to take advantage of that kind of, of an opportunity. So these are really long construction times, and this translates into very, very, very high costs. And a lot of these construction delays are, are under the guise of safety and security, and a lot of that isn't really real, but nonetheless it exists. At the end of the day, the nuclear reactor is just a heat source, right? It's replacing the coal hot box. The rest of it shouldn't go up in price at all. The, the generator, the power lines, the, power, the interface to the utilities, all of that shouldn't change very much. The part that you're really, that's different than a coal or gas plant is the place where the heat is generated. So you would think that the price of the rest of the structure also wouldn't change, but in fact, that part of a nuclear plant has gone up as well. When you break down the costs of, of how the, what these things uh, are made of, you find that the coolant that they use, when they use a water-based system, you have to protect against two things. You have to protect against the vessel itself where the heat is generated, so the pressure vessel. And then you also have to protect if that's breached, where all that steam will go in the event of a steam explosion. So these big containments that you see are designed to take the whole all the core water boiling off and vaporizing, and that pressure rise has to be managed by the primary containment. And they're great engineering structures, and they'll, and they'll do that, but they're incredibly expensive. And they dominate the cost. 18% of the total cost is just the containment, this, this thing to contain the steam explosion. And about a quarter of the cost is the pressure vessel, because they're operating at such high pressure. Recently, the, the French uh, cast a, a, a pressure vessel for a new reactor being built. I think it's in Sweden. And they messed up the fact that the, the, what the old cannon makers knew is that you had to have the carbon uh, distributed through the steel to make it uh, have the right strength. And they screwed up. In the, it, normally, when you're making a cannon, you cut the tops and the bottoms of the ingot off because those are depleted or too rich in carbon. They didn't cut the bottoms and tops off the ingot, so the top had too little carbon in it. So the whole vessel is bad and has to be replaced. So we're, we're not learning with experience like we should be. And so that, that, their 24% went up to maybe 35%. There's been a lot of design concepts since these 1960 designs. The so-called Generation 3 and Generation 4 designs have lots of safety built in. And really, they were more about regulatory compliance and safety compliance than cost. They're, they're beautiful designs. They're well engineered, at least the concepts anyway. None of them have been built. Uh, but they also have, are, have a lot of pots and pans, all of which are expensive. And so they are going to be more fuel efficient. They're going to use the fuel more efficiently. They'll be inherently safe, uh, but they won't necessarily be any cheaper. So they aren't addressing the primary problem with nuclear technology, which is the cost. The so-called molten salt, or even the molten metal cores, they take some of this cost away by reducing the pressure. They're going to be running at much, much lower pressures because you have to, you're boiling now a molten metal or a molten salt. So the pressures they're operating at are very low. Uh, and they have some advantages. But the core designs that they've used for these so far are pretty complicated. And so the core itself will have a fairly high cost associated with it. And there's no sign that these are going to be built for any cheaper than the existing uh, pressurized water reactors. So when I was growing up, we were dreaming of nuclear rockets. In fact, they had a nuclear airplane design. There were all kinds of things they were going to be doing with nuclear technology. This was sort of the dreaming period. It was exciting. There was, lot you can, there was nothing you couldn't do with nuclear. You, people used to use radiation for sizing shoes uh, when we were foolish. But uh, we haven't been dreaming really since, and it, but others have. The Russians now have, have really moved into a leadership role in dreaming about nuclear technology. If you look at what's happening worldwide in terms of who's going to be selling the advanced technology around the world, the Russians and the Chinese are both looking at very uh, advanced stages of competitiveness in this commercial market. The Russians have a floating reactor that was based on, on uh, pulling up one of their, their nuclear subs to a, a small village that ran out of power, and they hooked up jumper cables and ran the village from their submarine. So they have now a product uh, out there that they're advertising as a floating uh, power plant. They're building plants in India. That's based on uh, a, uh, one of their submarine molten metal reactor designs. So they're, they're out there commercializing the technology. And they have some pretty good technology. China also is moving forward. They've got lots of modern. If you go to some of these centers, they're, they're modern centers with modern equipment and lots and lots of young people who are excited about uh, nuclear technology. So China is certainly 
uh, moving quite rapidly forward in this nuclear space. And they, they, what you are able to do, they're building the same kinds of reactors they're building in the US, these, these uh, so-called AP-1000s. And the AP-1000 can be built in half the time in China than it is in the U United States. So they're building them faster and cheaper. They're building them all over the world. The Middle East is now installing nuclear reactors that were designed uh, in Iran. And actually, China has sold uh, one of their first Chinese design and build uh, models to the Middle East as well. So there's lots of activity commercially for uh, China and Russia. So for the US doesn't want to be left behind. So this was in the New York Times last weekend. Uh, the US acts to spur development of high-tech reactors, spur being that they've chosen, the DOE chose the two companies for $6 million. This is, uh, this is really a, running a full steam ahead with $6 million to be demonstrated by 2035. This is the, 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 the Department of Energy's answer to this worldwide change. And the two designs, by the way, that they have selected, one was a pebble bed reactor, which was in fact invented and designed in 1947, and uh, the molten chloride fast reactor, which was also from the uh, 1950s and 60s. They, they were already talking about that concept. So neither of these are new, uh, and they're not being spurred very heavily. So if you imagine the DOE spurring the automobile technology, in 1940 they would be looking at the Model A, and in 2016 we would have the Model A. Uh, so it's, it's a really tough uh, circumstance to work in, and a lot of this is structural. If you look at what the Department of Energy is, it's the Department of really a little bit of energy, because the vast majority of their budget isn't associated with really energy production at all. It's, it's associated with defense activities that aren't uh, related to making commercial power for people. The people who put together the plans for the Department of Energy, and I'll point out our current uh, uh, Secretary of Energy was a member of the committee that looks at this, and it's a lot of, there's a lot of internal work done by the people who, who get the benefits of the Department of Energy, who, who basically stamp what they're doing as being the way to go. Many decades are needed, so that's just a fact. It, does, it takes decades. No matter what you do, it's going to take decades, because that's what the report says, and, that there's, and we're going to use light water reactors for the coming decades. Um, and that we should try to explore ways to find uh, risk-based ways of of, of, um, of governing these things. In the end, it's, it's a bit of, stru of a structural issue, and this is where I think all of us have to be aware of how, how it works. You know, we have a private sector R&D um, effort in agriculture, chemical technology, non-nuclear power technology, electronics, industrial biotech, all of this stuff feeds the economy vigorously. And this is where innovation happens, and it's properly overseen by public safety organizations that protect the public, as it should. What's co what the government does is it controls, as it should, R&D for weapons systems, both nuclear, biological, and chemical, but it also, oddly, is in charge of nuclear power technology. And that's a little bit unusual. It, allows, it, it says that you can't really pursue the same kinds of innovations that you can in the private sector as long as this is run by the Department of Energy and the NRC. And it's, also, it's a historical remnant because of, of where and how these uh, systems arose, uh, but it's not something that necessarily has to be there. In fact, one could imagine a pretty easy change that seems to be pretty sensible is to make nuclear weapons under the Department of Defense and create a chemical and nuclear safety board, much like the chemical safety board, to oversee uh, commercial applications of, of nuclear power technology. And that, in fact, would probably give you a lot more uh, innovation in that space. So fortunately, it's, it's, it, things are tr trying to be done, and, and Bill Gates has been a real uh, uh, breath of fresh air in the sense that he has the money and the, and the clout to try to ch make things a little bit different. On the other hand, he was also denied access to use of our national labs for piloting his TerraPower uh, traveling wave reactor, which is an old design that was purported to uh, make use of the uh, spent fuel so that it, there was no more actinized or no long-lived uh, waste products. In fact, it, it, they've recently changed their design basis and they're using a molten salt design. Um, but nonetheless, he and, and many other small companies are trying to move in the best way they can through this uh, regulatory uh, morass. Uh, 
So when you look at what was approved by the uh, DOE as the advanced reactor technology, the pebble bed reactor, which again was invented by you know, Farrington Daniels back in 1947, uh, was based on the idea that if you have pebbles of uranium, and rather than cooling them with water, you would cool them with helium gas. And that gas could then go into a gas turbine and, and uh, generate electricity. It's been improved upon considerably by really nice work looking at how you might take fuel pellets and make them inherently safe so that, so that when they expand and get too hot, it sort of turns off the nuclear reactions. It makes the cross sections for absorption and fission of neutrons change in a way that so-called has a negative temperature uh, coefficient so that they shut themselves down if they get too hot. And they're really, it's a very beautiful design. Uh, by the way, it's going to be built in China long before the, uh, 2038 on the DOE's time center. They're already piloting a small unit in Shanghai, uh, a pebble bed design. So it's not clear that this is going to be helpful for us in the US. The other design, the, the, the uh, molten chloride uh, uh, fast reactor, this is also a relatively old design. It's a, it is a, this one I happen to like a lot because it has a very simple core. It's a fast spectrum reactor, so it doesn't have any moderator. All the fuels dissolve in the salt itself. So the uranium is, is put in the right concentration in the, in the fuel salt, and it circulates through heat exchangers. You take the heat out in one step. And it, when it gets too hot, the density uh, uh, decreases and it shuts itself off. So it has a very nice uh, uh, controllable uh, heat production. And it, if it gets too hot, it boils the salt and takes the heat out. So it has lots and lots of nice properties. Unfortunately, when you use the chloride salt, uh, there, are some corro there are a lot of corrosion issues. Uh, but many of those are, are now understood a lot better than they were in the 1970s. At the end of the day, what my view of this, the sustainability target should be is that we want to give the utilities an option to not build a coal plant. So you have to really come up with a design that can take and replace a coal furnace. And, and people who are building today brand new coal plants aren't going to want to shut those down. They've put all this capital down, and they don't want to have to turn it off. So you really want to replace their coal bo hot box with something that's affordable for them at a price that can be uh, make it justify putting this, this nuclear heater in place of their coal heater. Because at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with a coal plant except for the fact that you're burning coal. So all you want is a different heater. So we've done a fair amount of work looking at new design bases that are, are where, where we start with the fact that it has to be really cheap. So the reactor has to be cheap so we can provide a cost basis to, for an investor to put money into it and make, make some money. So can, the, can you build something in between what, the, what nature did for free and what we do today for $10 or so a watt? Is there something in between? And that's where these molten uh, salt reactors are really quite interesting because we know from volcanoes, volcanoes churn away in, in Hawaii with molten salt at 800 degrees or 1200 degrees and it doesn't poison all the groundwater around Hawaii. People still drink the water and they, because they sort of self-seal themselves off with glass. And there's lots of ways you can design a molten metal or molten salt reactor to effectively just churn away and make heat much like nature did 2.5 billion years ago. We call these things bubbling bed cauldron reactors. So you just want this thing to be, generate heat and be able to extract it in an inexpensive way. It doesn't have to be particularly efficient, but it has to be cheap. So we've been working with Sam Shanner, who's a UCSB graduate now at MIT in, in the Quartz Smith's group. He's a neutronics guy. And so we've designed a couple of, of as we, we call them, active core direct cooled uh, reactors that basically have an active core where you have a molten salt, is what, where the fuels dissolve. There's reflectors on the outside, and you cool it on the top. So the hot salt goes up, you direct contact cool it with gas, you pull the, ga the gas pulls out the fission fragments, we, or fission projects like xenon, so you, you, which you have to take out anyway. And the, the whole thing circulates by natural convection. If it ever gets too hot, the density increases and it shuts itself off. If you turn the cooler off, if, you, if for some reason the, the cooling fails, it, gets, it heats itself up, it expands the salt, and it turns itself off. So it's geometrically critical, we call it. There's lots of different ways you can do it. But basically, you want the salt so that if it gets hot, it, it boils and it changes its density, so it shuts itself off. And, it's, and, we have, and there's lots of ways to do that. This is just one that we're fooling around with. We've done the neutronics, and it's relatively easy to control. All of this stuff can be done 
if you let young people like Sam use their imagination a little bit and say it doesn't have to look like a PWR. The other strategy is to try to make the industry as a whole be more competitive. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, we've we learned what we learned from biofuels is that making fuel is not the best thing to do. What, what biofuels people did is they turned into chemical companies because electricity and fuel are cheap. The first few things of a new design, you want to make them make money. And so there's lots of things with nuclear processes that make, can make money a lot more than making electricity. So if you look at the unique features of a, of a nuclear reaction and compare it to what goes on in a fuel burning reactor, in a fuel burning reactor you just do chemical oxidation and you make heat. Before you actually have fission and heat, you have the formation of radiation and that radiation has in some ways unique properties. In fact, it's very unique in the sense that it has very high energy and can do things that heat from a thermal oxidation could never do. And is there value in that radiation that you can make use of to make a nuclear process more competitive? And so if you look at the value chain of what goes on in a, in a nuclear process, the most valuable thing you can make are isotopes. Medical isotopes are worth a fortune. Now the market isn't very big, but you, you can make a lot of money making isotopes. And there's other uses for them. They use them in various industries. But it's a relatively small market, but it's a high value. But in the middle, there's chemicals that you can make that are much more valuable than making electricity. And this is exactly what people did in the biofuels areas. They found that these mid-range chemicals have a lot more value, so make those first. Well, people have talked about doing this. They talked about making desalinated water with uh, nuclear power plants. The problem with making desalinated water, if you look at just selling electricity from a, a one gigawatt uh, nuclear plant, you might make $83 million a year or so. If you make desalinated water and make less power because you're using that power for the desalination plant, you don't change your economics very much because water isn't worth very much. So desalinated water just isn't the right product to make. The DOE has a big program to make hydrogen. Well, the problem is hydrogen doesn't, isn't worth anything either. So you have, you're taking electricity, which is pretty valuable, and making it into hydrogen, which is less or the same value. So that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because you're adding more capital. So those aren't really good choices for chemicals that you would want to make in order to make a nuclear process make a little bit more money. Now, there's a lot of examples of things you can make. Here's an example from Dow Chemical back in 1963. They made ethyl uh, bromide, and they did that because there was lead in the gas, and they had to add it to the fuel. So people have used radiation to make chemicals in the past, valuable chemicals. And there's a lot more that you could look at. If you went back to the literature, for example, they've irradiated everything under the sun and found lots of interesting products that one might make if you put your mind to it. So there's lots of things one might do with the radiation to, make, again, make more money. And we think this, this is a real way of, of uh, generating opportunity. Finally, in the manufacturing, if you don't manufacture nuclear reactors and their components like you do the components of, of other kinds of energy systems, the cost isn't going to come down. And I think the cost of manufacturing is one area where uh, we can really make some changes. But, but it's only going to happen if you know you're going to make a certain number of units. And if you know you're going to be getting orders for 100 units a year, then you'll put the money into manufacturing it and manufacturing it well. If you look what the oil and gas industry does for these $1 billion oil platforms, they have enormous manufacturing yards where they make many of these at a time. But they have specialized workers there on staff working 24-7. And they've got these things around the clock building oil platforms at costs that come way down over building one at a time. And the same kind of manufacturing scaling can be done if one puts their mind to it. In order to give you a chance for some questions, I want to close with this these, these uh, comments about the nuclear power option. It's certainly imperfect. And one, one thing that I always will acknowledge, it's, it, it's, it's one of its problems is that it emits radiation. And that's just a fact. And like any, with any technology, there will be future accidents. No, there's zero probability that won't happen. The nuclear power industry has, has misled and lied to the public in the past. That's a, a reason to not like it. Uh, nuclear power is presently uneconomical. That's the real reason to not like it. The, 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 the nuclear power plants that we would build today aren't cost effective. They're not competitive with fossil fuels, and they're not competitive with wind power and lots of other things that are out there. So, and without private sector innovation, that's unlikely, in my opinion, to change. Why it should be pursued, though, it's proven that it can produce massive amounts of CO2-free electricity. 
modern technology, the stuff that's going out there now, if you call that modern, is, is safe by any reasonable measure. If you look at the safety record of the nuclear industry, including accidents that have been well publicized, it still hurts less people per kilowatt hour produced than anything else out there. If you go to low pressure molten cores of metals or, or salts and mass produce them in factories, there's a, there's a large potential to bring those costs down even lower and make them a lot safer. The rest of the world, this is important, the rest of the world is doing it anyway. It doesn't really matter what the US does. And, whether, and if we have Western innovators involved in it, it's going to be better. It's going to be safer and it's going to be done better than if we don't. So one of the reasons I, I think we, it, it makes a lot of sense for us to take a look at that option is because it's going to be done with us or without us. It doesn't really matter. And I think it's better to lead the world in technology associated with the greatest force in nature than to follow. So with that, I will take questions and, and end. It has, I think, for the, for the wrong reasons. At the end of the day, we're doing this because of CO2 in the atmosphere. You've got to replace coal plants. And you don't replace a coal plant 50 megawatts at a time. 50 megawatt you know, diesel generator for a construction site is, is not going to make any difference in the, in the likelihood that we're going to have climate change. It's gigawatt coal plants. So I think it's fine if it helps people get used to it. But the problem is that you, if you have a thousand 50 megawatt systems, your probability of having one of those have an accident is high. And if it's a 50 megawatt accident, it's going to be as bad for the industry as a gigawatt, because both of them will have limited problem, actually, in terms of releases, but both of them will get the same amount of press. And, and why would you want to do that? It doesn't give you, get you to your end goal. Your end goal is to produce electricity without making CO2. So I think that it, it seems to be a nice thing to do. It doesn't get you where you want. If you wanted to do that for making your first small, if it, the capital is lower to build that as your intermediate stage stepping stone to a gigawatt, then, then I'm all for it. But if it, in itself, I don't think it's a, a, a place I would put a lot of intention. So, uh, one, I, I see a lot of press releases in the news from these little companies. Mm -hmm. they, they often look like it's sort of two people and a copy of AutoCAD advertising their new reactor. Is there, first, is there any path for little startups to actually eventually build a billion dollar capital thing? And then the other question is, where is GE, where is General Atomics, and where are the big companies in the innovation? Let me answer the little co companies first. The little companies, one thing I love about them is they dream, right? And they all believe they're going to go to the NRC and get the rules changed. Well, the rules are that if you bring out a new reactor design, you have to pay for the NRC to learn about your design at their rate and you have to pay for that. And then they're going to evaluate a safety case for you. And you go through this 10-year period, and you don't know what the answer is. And you spending money the whole time, that's a kiss of death for a small company. So they're doing AutoCAD because that's what they can do and because of the, the, the framework that we have in the US for us having to pay for the safety case evaluation just to do a, 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 any, put any radiation at all in your, in your uh, small reactor test, ca test loop. So they're, they're all, you know, I, I give them a lot of credit for getting out there, but it's a tough, the structure is against them. The ones that I advise, I tell them to go to Argentina, where, the, where they actually build pilot, they've got a good infrastructure of work, uh, in, uh, educated workers in that space, and they have a regulatory environment that likes pilot plants and new designs. And so if I'm advising them, I tell them to go to Argentina, which is a shame because it should be being done here. Uh, on the, as far as GE and, and Westinghouse, <laughs> They've been beaten down. So they invested a lot of money early on. They thought this was going to be a, a huge business for them. They've been beaten up, and they know that these things are – they've accepted the reality that the DOE isn't going to change. I mean, with the slide I put up there is a dream. It's not going to happen. Uh, it, 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 I mean, that's their view. I wish it could happen, but I don't think it's going to happen unless everyone in this room gets mad about it, and I don't think that's going to happen. So. Uh, from a probability basis, as a shareholder in GE, I'm glad they're not going crazy on some new design because they're going to make money selling enough of the old designs. But I, I think they've been beaten up and 
they, it's they're not in their risk profile. They can make a lot more money selling gas turbines. Oh, I, I don't disagree with the cost. You don't want to compete with, with gas, but what you want to be able to do is shut the coal plant down first. A guy who just finished his coal plant construction last month isn't going to shut that one down for, unless he's got a good reason to do it. And, and I'd rather shut those down first and give them a, a value proposition that makes it worth their while to it. And I actually believe that it's possible. I believe it's possible because he's going to have to pay for coal. He has to pay, pay for the upkeep of that coal plant, which isn't nothing. And if you can give him a, a low-cost heater, to replace his coal box, he's going to do it. But it won't happen if it's not low cost. A gas plant has, you know, even if they pay the CO2 tax, it's not so, uh, I don't see, foresee them being uneconomical for a while. But coal plants may be uneconomical. Okay. <laughs> Going back to the designs that, that I would say that I favor going forward would be the molten salt designs. And those designs, you leave the actinides in the core. You have no long-term waste in these things. So the actinides don't leave the core. The only thing that leaves the core are fission fragments, which you can separate electrochemically or pyrochemically, and we know how to do that. It's been tested. We don't do that today because of lots of reasons. For one reason, uranium oxide is so cheap. It's cheaper just to put it, to put the fuel. When, when there's a cost reason to get rid of the waste, they'll do it. But right now, it doesn't cost anything to set it in the parking lot in a, in a concrete pile. You're right, they're not, they, haven't been, they haven't paid yet for that, but in fact, they have. When you, when you run a, a nuclear power plant, each month you have to put money into a fund that goes to your long-term way. So it has, in fact, been accounted for. It's just that there's no place to put it, but they've paid for it. There's a giant fund that's paid for long-term waste storage. And it, but it's just not used because the U.S. government hasn't approved a long-term waste facility. I don't, I don't personally favor doing that because that's good fuel in there. There's plutonium and uranium in there that you can use in a reactor. Why would you want to put that underground when you can use it for making power? But, you know, I, I didn't make the rules. And if one builds a cycle, which, we all, which people always envisioned that you would reprocess fuel, that was always in the cards. No one ever thought we were going to do this once through fuel cycle which goes into long-term storage. That was, was never envisioned by people who were imagining the cycle. It just happened to become that way. But that's not what you would do in a thriving uh, uh, global nuclear industry. You would recycle all that stuff. Why would you want to put plutonium and uranium in the ground? <laughs> that's a, that's a, it's a good one. It's a good question. I mean, it, I don't want to belittle it, but people who make weapons will tell you <laughs> that you don't go to a, a pile of nuclear waste which is emitting gamma rays and has all these fission fragments in it and has n all the other uranium isotopes that you have to separate anyway to make a bomb, when you can go drive in, your, in the back country of Australia and get out of your car and shovel in some uranium oxide, it's not radioactive and nobody knows you're doing it, and you can go separate. You're going to need, you're gonna need a centrifuge either way. Why would you, you risk going into a place that's guarded, ha is radioactive, and that everyone, every uh, uh, agency can find you if of the gamma emissions, why would you do that? It, it, it's true, you could make a weapon out of that stuff, but there's so many easier ways to do it. Uh, you can go buy one off the black market. There's lots of ways to, to make a weapon if that's what you're committed to doing, and probably low on your list is to go take this messy, spent fuel and take out fissile elements from it when you can go dig them up in the ground and they're not going to be irradiating you the whole time. So I, I don't, I, I mean, it's just the reality of making a weapon. And so it, it's, it's a concern, but if you, and again, in the molten salt reactor, all those actinides are in the core. So how are they going to go get, the, get it out of the core? 
But all those countries can get uranium, on, uh, just uranium oxide from the dirt, and then they can, they can separate it. So it's not, it, doesn't keep, it doesn't end the problem. It's a good question. I mean, it, no one stopped uh, the French from pr you know, promoting and innovating in, in these reactors, but they have the same controls on fuel. It's not that, that uh, Arriva can go and, and willy-nilly try a new core design. It's not, it, it's not allowed. Um, they like, I think if you're a signatory to the, the non-proliferation treaty, you have to be governed by more or less the same rules for ha handling uh, fuels and, and so forth as the U.S. is. Now those rules, I think, are over for the reasons of this uh, proliferation risk that was mentioned. I think they might be a little bit, they should be reexamined, uh, but they are, the rules exist. So, I, I, and I think also in, in France, a lot of that was done by the government. A lot of the, the uh, programs were run by the government. So they didn't, it's never really had that rich private sector uh, innovation spurt that, that you might expect. In Sweden, I think it's, it's small, the R&D effort. These are, these are big numbers you're going to be spending on these things. And, and I think they, they, haven't they just recently completed like a mega <coughs> reactor project where the costs are completely out of control and that's new testing? That was a, but that was a, a, a French reactor design, actually. It was an a, a EPR reactor. That was the one I was mentioning that where they forgot about the carbon uh, diffusion. That's a good question. I don't really know completely how to answer it. Um, good question. When I first went to, to college, actually, I, I, fusion was, I love fusion. If you want to talk about cost, I mean, if you think a, a fission reactor is expensive, no matter how you imagine implementing fusion, assuming it works and assuming you're able, there's no imaginable configuration that's going to be in time to have any impact on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that you could imagine having a cost that's going to be lower than a fission reactor. My view has always been that you do fission first and then you continue working on fusion and someday it, it, the cost may come down. I'm not optimistic about that just because of the things one needs to do to contain the, the, the plasma and all. But uh, it's, it's, I, I always have hope about it. I love it. I mean, it's interesting and great stuff. I wish more physicists worked on it. Um, but uh, it's, it's a really complicated problem, and it's going to be very expensive, and I don't see any indication it's going to be cheap. Even the ones that was recently uh, released from uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, that looks to be really expensive per watt. 